We come to you at this time thanking you for this day, thanking you for the opportunity that we have to be able to assemble this morning, to have a period of time to be concerned about those that we know and those that we can pray about. Pray, Father, for Bonnie Lovett as she's in the local hospital. We pray, Father, that as she is feeling better, that she will continue to feel that way. As she has about four or three more days of treatments left, we pray, Father, that she will uh, continue to feel better every step of the way and that she'll be able to go home at the appropriate time. Pray, Father, also for Bobby as he's uh, quarantined at home. We pray, Father, that as he's at home, he'll have all the things he needs, and we know that his family's taking care of him as well. We pray, Father, that he, as he's concerned about Bonnie, will be okay. Pray, Father, for Joy Jenkins this morning, for Beth Cooper, for Beth and Casey Carden, as all of, all of those are at home sick. We pray, Father, for a speedy recovery for them. We pray, Father, for Willard Carr as he has pneumonia. And we pray, Father, that as they're still treating him, he will continue to grow stronger every day as he's currently weak right now. Pray, Father, for Debbie Rogers as she's still in the hospital. We pray, Father, that as she's been moved to a, uh, what would be no, a, a regular style room out of the ICU, that she'll continue to improve. And we pray, Father, that when, when appropriate, she'll be able to go home as well. We pray, Father, for Christine Turner as she is expecting and anticipating an upcoming procedure on her back. We pray, Father, that that procedure is planned. We pray, Father, that plan will be put into place and all will be well and she will be able to go home that day as it is scheduled. We're ever so thankful, Father, for all the wonderful things that can be done in the medical world as we live. We pray, Father, for all the procedures that can be had, for all the, the technology that's improved to advance, for all the studies that have been made to, to be able to make us better quicker. We pray, Father, for all of those that are working on the vaccine and other things that have to do with the virus that's changed our world as we currently know it. We pray, Father, for all of those that are working in the what we would call the front lines in the hospitals and the doctor's offices at this time. We're so thankful, Father, for those that are willing to continue to work. We're thankful, Father, for everything and everyone that we've prayed about so far. We pray, Father, that as we are here this morning, we will be ever so thankful. Thankful that we have this time. Thankful that we have this day. And we pray, Father, that as we're in this short hour together in this Bible class, and as we're in our short hour in just a moment in worship, that we will recognize the beauty of the situation that we're in, an opportunity to spend time in prayers, inside of your word, and singing together this morning in the Lord's Supper, and even in our giving this morning. We pray, Father, that as we are collectively in these two different timed assemblies, Bible class and worship, that we will recognize the true privilege it is to set aside this time and we will recognize the greatness that exists when we come together in prayer and in all the acts as we enter into worship in just a few moments and as we're in our Bible class now. And that we will grow and train ourselves to appreciate these moments more. That we will open up our minds. That we will open up our hearts. That we may look at your word. That we may see all the beauties that are found in your word. And that we may leave this place this morning encouraged. Knowing the greatest place for us to find encouragement strength and hope is found when your people gather together and when we assemble inside of your word and we're thankful father this morning that we have that time we pray father that we'll put you first in our lives that we'll put you first over our own wants and wishes we'll put you first over our own cares we'll put you first over the things that we believe are priorities and that you will truly be first we pray father for all of those who are fathers and, and leaders that they will exemplify, that they will show forth the life of Christ, that we all as we live will show forth the life of Christ and that when Jesus comes, we may be called into heaven. We pray, Father, that we'll live not later for heaven, but we'll live now for heaven. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We are in our class this morning entitled The Life of Christ. And you'll remember our entire study is designed to get us to learn to walk in the steps of Christ himself. And we aim to do that as we go through our study, especially as we are this morning. We've already looked at two segments in our class so far. We have looked at the segment, Why Study Jesus Christ? And I believe that as you remember that segment, as you go back over that material that you will recognize that there are many more reasons for us to study Christ 
Uh, can you name me the greatest reason for studying Christ? I know you didn't come here to take a quiz, but why not? What's the greatest reason for studying Christ? Oh, we want to be more like him. He's going to be in heaven. He commands us to. I think there's a better one. Because we want to. I think that one's good. He's coming back. Think about that for just a minute. I, I, all of these are good. Now, we can't make one of them better than the other, but just think about it. He's coming back. And, and if we want to meet him, we've got to be like him. If we want to be with him, I've got to do what he says. Great reasons for us to study about Christ. We looked last week at his existence and his attributes, and this week we're going to spend time looking at Jesus in the Old Testament. And then as we continue to go through our class, we'll look at all the things, especially next week, we will look at the prophecies concerning Christ in the Old Testament. But what we're trying to do today in Jesus in the Old Testament is we want to look at the times where Jesus is present in the Old Testament. Now, one thing to remember, this is something that we talked about in the previous class as we looked at his existence and his attributes. But when did Jesus come into existence? I know that's kind of a rounded question. He always has been. So Jesus did not show up in the book of Matthew, did he? Okay, so remember that. We, we think about John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Verses 1, 2, and 3 tell us that he arrived and he, he was there. Verse 14 tells us before he was Jesus, who was he? The Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. John chapter 1, verse 14, and the rest of the verses there for you. So Jesus did not just come into uh, the scene as he was needed in Matthew chapter 1, as we see the time that was set forth as we studied last week. But Jesus was one who was always in existence. Now what we have to do is we've got to figure out, well, where was he? How do we know it's him? What, what was he doing? What, what was he involved with? And figure out Jesus as we look at him in the Old Testament. Now, there are a number, a large number of references to Jesus in the Old Testament. We're not looking at a one of them today in specific as talking about the prophecies of Jesus. Things like Isaiah 7, 14, uh, Genesis 3, 15. We're not going to look at passages like that today. But we're going to try to find scenes where we see Jesus and see someone who exhibits that second person of the Godhead. And what we're going to do is in fivefold. We're going to look at Jesus and creation. Let's look at Jesus in the very beginning and see some things that have to do with Jesus and some things that help us understand about Jesus. And then let's look at Jesus when it comes to four different individuals in the Old Testament. Uh, let's look at the life of Abraham and let's see if we can see the life of Christ in the life of Abraham. Let's look at the life of Jacob and let's see if we can see the life of Christ in the life of Jacob. Let's look at Moses and let's look at Joshua and let's see if we can see the life of Christ, the second person of the Godhead. He's not going to be called Jesus in the Old Testament. He's not going to be called Jesus Christ in what we're going to look at today. But we are going to see the second person of the Godhead being existent in creation and through, the, through these individuals' lives as we go through our study this morning. Let's talk about creation and see these things come to fruition. Uh, go with me to Genesis. You've studied these passages before. I want you to see Genesis chapter 1. Now, this will be the kind of fundamental one. And then, of course, when we look at John chapter 1 in just a minute in verse 14, in the last segment here, in this particular point, you will be very familiar with that passage. I feel like I've brought that one up a lot lately, and that's okay. But in Genesis chapter 1, here's what you find. Look with me in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Who created the heavens and the earth? God. Okay, how do we know that outside of Genesis 1-1? Might as well continue our theme of a pop quiz. How do we know that outside of Genesis 1-1? Okay, there are a variety of other passages that tell us that before the foundation of the world were laid by God, that these things were put into play. How else do we know? How else do we know? What does the psalm say about this world that tells us God is the one that created it? When we look at its beauty, when we look at its grandeur, we can see a creator. 
We can see something more higher power than ourselves. So we look at the evidence in the physical world. Was this world an accident? Science wants you to believe that just these random series of events took place and they had to take place at the precise exact time and some grand explosion or some other things took place and, and we came from a fish or a monkey. By the way, just in that thought, what's the human going to be if, if the fish and the monkey evolved? What's the human going to be? Why aren't they trying to figure that out? Grand design, huh? So in, in Genesis chapter 1, you have God who begins in the beginning God. When, when all things began as you and I understand it, there was God. And God created all things. Go down to verse 26. You read in verse 26, and I want you to see the fifth word. And God said, let us. He's not talking to Adam and Eve yet. How do you know that? How do you know he's not talking to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 26? Well, they've not been created yet, okay? So, so in this conversation, they're not here. Just as much as before you and I were alive, no one had a conversation with us. But God said, let us, and as you study Genesis 1.26, through the scheme of the entire Bible, which we will not do today, you will find that the us is the Father, the Word of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three being involved, the Father being the great planner, Jesus being the executor, and the Holy Spirit being the finisher in the scenes of the things that we see here. And as you pattern that through the Old and the New Testament. So what you have as you begin thinking about God is you have God who says us, which indicates to us in the first 26 verses that there is more than just one that makes up the Godhead. I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and I want you to notice with me verses 16 and 17. Colossians 1, and I want you to notice with me verses 16 and and 17, because in this particular passage, we're going to learn something about Jesus, and we're going to look at the third word of Colossians 1, 16. Then we're going to have to figure out who that is. Colossians 1, 16 reads this way as we look at verse 16 and 17. For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, or things created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. All right, Colossians 1, verse 16, the third word. For by him, who's the him? And how do you know it? It's Christ. That's right. It's context. Remember this. Don't pick a passage out. Pick it up. And look at it over here, because if you do that, you'll never know who the him is. You'll never know the who, the what, the why, the reasoning, the times. And you'll have a weird understanding of Scripture because you've placed a passage outside of what's going on. For by him, it's Jesus Christ that's being talked about. You also look at verse 4. Since we heard of your faith. So what's interesting, before verse 16... And after verse 16, exclusively references who? Jesus Christ. I do love verse 18, talking about him being the head of the body. What's the body? It's the church. Jesus is still sitting on his throne today. We'll study more about that tonight in our sermon. So you have Jesus, who did what? Colossians 1 verse 16. For by things all things were created. Now listen to this. Both in heaven and in earth. Now listen to these things about the earth. Whether visible or invisible. Are there things that you don't see in this world? Wouldn't you like to know what the center of the earth looks like? Maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. Are there other things you'd like to know that you, that you can't see? Wouldn't you know, want to know like what oxygen looks like? Is it there? Everybody just did the breed test. Okay, it's still there. Wouldn't you like to know what that looks like? Wouldn't you like to know what the depth of the sea looks like? If there are 
creatures that we've seen, imagine the creatures that we have not seen. Hmm. Maybe even the same is true with the wooded areas of this world. This world is very vast. And though we are a very modern people, we've not covered every inch of it to know every little animal that exists. I believe that's a fallacy to think we're that important and we're that good. So it's Jesus who created all things. But look at this. Would they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers? Isn't that interesting? Which gives us the indication, and here I am giving away tonight's lesson, that Jesus is still working where? Here and when? Still today. For by him all things exist, and for by him, verse 17, all things continue to consist. Not only that, as you look at the book of Hebrews, you will learn that Jesus is the one who laid the foundation. You look at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, and it reads this way, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. Was Jesus involved in creation? Every bit. Everything that you and I know and everything that you and I understand, Jesus was involved in. Now, by the way, what else took place inside of creation? So man was created. What took place next? I'm not talking about in the order of physical things that were created, but what did God do for man after man was created? All right, created woman, a helpmate. What else happened? All right, think exclusively to man and woman. What, what did God do for man and woman that he has done? Say that again. Gave him a place to live. Think a little deeper. He told them what was right and what was wrong. Think about God in the New Testament. Think about Jesus in the New Testament. Think about John chapter 1, verse 14 that we're going to look at. And the Word, I find that really interesting. God has always... For every created human being, listen to that, for every created human being, from the beginning, and we've not seen the end yet, to the end, God has made sure that they know what they must do. That's very important. It's very important to notice. In the very beginning, was Adam and Eve told what was right and what was wrong? We try to make things too complicated. For you and I, do we know what's right and what is wrong? I understand there are gray areas. I, I get that. But do you know what's right? Do you know what's wrong? Okay. I know there are some things that we question, and maybe we just need to leave those things alone. But God made sure that we know What's right? And Jesus was made flesh, and everything in the past took place for that moment. By the way, everything in the future took place for another moment that we'll talk about also tonight in our sermon. I'm going I'm to quit giving away tonight. So Jesus, the Word, became flesh, and here you and I can understand Him. So we have Jesus who is in creation. Now, what we need to do next is we're going to look at four different individuals. So we see that Jesus was involved in the Old Testament. But now let's kind of see how in a deeper way, in a way that you and I will understand that Jesus was involved. Let's look at Abraham. Now, to do that, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 18, Genesis chapter 19, and Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 18, 19, and 22. So meet me in Genesis 18. Now, what we've got to do and what we're planning on doing in our lesson from this point forward, and I'll back this slide up so you can see this, we're going to look at Abraham and Jacob in a more closer way. And then I'm going to give you the passages for Moses and Joshua, and you'll be able to look at those on your own. We'll talk about them, but we won't look at them in such a deep way as we will Abraham and Jacob. 
And what you will find is, and you'll have to do some study on your own on this, these are not the only four occasions where the second person of the Godhead, you and I would call him Jesus, exists or shows up in the Old Testament. Now what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to really study and really recognize some words that take place here in the Old Testament. But go with me to Genesis 18, and I want you to look at verses 1 and 2. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent in the door, in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the door, from the tent door, and, and bowed himself toward the ground. All right, so who do you have in Genesis 18, 1 and 2? Who, who's that? And how do you know? Well, a couple of ways. Remember what happens before it and what happens after it. Before it is Abraham. Verse 6 is Abraham. It's right for us to conclude that this is Abraham who's sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and he looked and he saw some men there and he goes out to meet them. So what I want you to do next is I want you to go down to verse 9. Uh, we're going to have to jump down to there. Uh, he said unto them, "Where is?" Or this is one of the individuals that was there, said to him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. Now, without going any further, who knows what's taking place in Genesis 18? What information is Sarah going to find out? All right, she's going to have a child now. What do you and I know about Sarah as we read about her in verse 9? She, she, she's very, I'm going to say it this way, aged, old. All right. How many of you, just, just listen with me for a minute. And I'm not being discriminatory when I say this, but how many of you right now would like to have a child? Ugh. <laughs> imagine Sarah they've been given this promise you're going to have a child and, and of you Abraham and Sarah of you Abram and Sarah is going to become this great nation well it never happens it never happens it never happens and, and finally when they are old these men come these individuals come there are three of them and they meet them at the door and verse 10 he said I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life and lo Sarah Thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Maybe we need to start calling old people those that are stricken with age. All right, here's, here's what's happening. It was long past the normal time for someone of her and his age to have what? A child. So something happens, verse 12. Then Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I, ha shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? I'm old. My husband's old. What was her response? A little internal chuckle. Now, keep going down. Look at verse 13. This is very important. And the Lord said unto Abraham, all right, let me ask you a question. Who's that? Who's that? All right, let's go back up to the beginning. Look at verse 2. And look at verse 1. Read verse 2 first, then we'll read verse 1. And he lifted up his eyes, and lo, three men stood by him. Look at verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him. Who's that? All right. God is an appropriate answer. You're right. Who's that? Uh, many people look at this as angels. By the way, if we, if we keep reading on, and we're going to do this in just a minute, we're going to look at verse 22 and then jump into chapter 19, verse 1. We're going to notice that one is going to stay and two are going to go. Jump into chapter 19 with me first. Let's just see verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom. All right, now let's talk about this word, word angel for just a minute. 
when you hear the word angel, what do you generally think of? All right. The proper definition of angel is a messenger, a messenger, a worker, okay, a worker. It, it does not denote solely some being that has little wings that flies around, even though that's how we'll see them depicted in artist renderings. You and I will notice that as you study angels, you will not find one in the Old or New Testament that has wings. There are the cherubims and seraphims, but we don't exactly call them angels because they're classed in their own. They could be, but, but they might not be. So, so angels are not just some created type being in the regard that that's all they are. It's a messenger. It's a worker. Now, there are beings that were created that serve this purpose. Now, two of these three continued on. But I want you to notice some things. In verse 1, the Lord. Inside of verse 12, verse 13, the Lord. Now go with me to verse 22. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, verse, 9, or verse 1 of chapter 19, but Abraham stood yet before who? The Lord. I will suggest to you that this is the second person of the Godhead. It's the Lord. Now, what's interesting is, as you read about this, and we're going to see this play out in a variety of things. Go with me to Genesis chapter 22. Let's see this play out. And if time allows us, we'll go through all of these. Hopefully we'll have time, but we'll see. Genesis chapter 22. Go with me to verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now, pause there. What's going to happen in Genesis 22? Ah, there's a sacrifice getting ready to be made. Verse 1, God's going to tempt Abraham. Said to him, Abraham, he said, behold, here am I. Now, here's a good reaction when you hear the words of God. Here am I. Who else said here am I? Old Testament. Here am I, send me, he said, I, I, Isaiah. Okay, so Abraham has the same response. Here am I. Now verse 2, this, this verse particularly hurts. Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee to the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains I will tell thee of. Now I don't know what Abraham's thoughts were. But I imagine part of him wanted to say, can't do that, can't do that. Mainly because of the descriptive terms that are found in verse 2. Your only son, whom you what? Whom you love. By the way, what is one of the greatest characteristics of the word love? If we love someone, we will never harm them. Now there's a difference in corrective disciplining and harm. By the way, isn't corrective discipline helping? Even though it's not really understood at that time, it's seen more clearly later. We'll never harm those that we love. By the way, the New Testament talks about a lot about family relationships, friendships, and our relationship with God in the terms of love and in the terms of never harming one another. So here's Abraham. And he's told that he is to go and to sacrifice his son. Go down with me to verse 11. We're kind of skipping some things. I want you to read something. And the angel of the Lord, so he gets everything ready. He, he's preparing to sacrifice his son. And the angel of the Lord calls out to him. Who is that? Well, let's keep reading a few verses. Look with me into verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called out unto Abraham of heaven, or out of heaven, the second time. Now not only do we kind of get a, a, a sense of who this might be, but we get a location of the one that this might be. Where did this one call out? Mm, from heaven. Read with me verse 18. Now, read clearly. I want you to pick up a word. It's, 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 it's a very important word. Now, this, this angel calls out, this messenger calls out, 
and says this, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Pick out an important word from verse 18. Pick out a very important word in verse 18. Very close to the one I'm looking for. Very close. There's a lot of application for you and I in the word obeyed. But think about the one that's speaking. And find a word that relates to the one that's speaking. My. Okay. My voice. So, do we obey the voice of angels or do we obey the voice of the Lord? Which one? Who has the authority? The Lord does. All right, so this messenger, this angel, this one that's doing the pre this presenting, who is in heaven and who says it is my voice of which Abraham is going to obey, who is that? Well, there are only three possibilities, right? There's only the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I'll suggest to you that it's the middle, that this is the second person of the Godhead who is the messenger in this scene. So it is Abraham who had an encounter with the word, or as we would call him in the New Testament, Jesus Christ. Go with me to Genesis chapter 28. Let's notice Jacob. Let's notice Jacob. Let's notice Jacob who's going to have a dream in Genesis 28, 11, and 12. Verse 11, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and laid down in that place for sleep. Pause with me, verse 11. How many of you have a pillow of stone? That's just something to think about. By the way, sometimes you read verses that tell us how spoiled we are. That's one of them. In his travels, he didn't stop at the Holiday Inn. He stopped at the stones, and he made them in the end. Verse 12, and he dreamed, so he slept. Behold, a ladder set up upon the earth on top, and it reached into heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, Behold, who stood above it? The Lord. I am the Lord, God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land which thou liest to thee, I will, or will I give it, and to thy seed." Many people like Robert Taylor Jr. will attribute Genesis chapter 28, verse 13, as the second person of the Godhead. Remember this word angels. What does it mean? Messenger. What is Jesus? He's definitely, when we see the scenes of the Godhead, he is the one that gives a lot of the message, right? In fact, what did Jesus in the New Testament do? He taught, didn't he? What did Jesus promise those disciples in the New Testament? What did he promise them? The Comforter, which would bring them into remembrance. What sort of things I have told you, he taught. You also see an occasion in Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, which also has to do with Jacob. In Genesis 32, I want you to pick up with me in verse 24. A lot of things took place to get Jacob to this particular point. And in verse 24, and Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Who's this man? Well, let's, let's keep, keep reading. Let's keep studying. Go with me to verse 30. So some questions take place. Some answers are given. And Jacob calls the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved by the way, you go look at this particular name of this place of which Jacob called this area, and it has a reference to the Lord. Who was this one of which Jacob wrestled with? Well, if it's the Lord, it can only be a number of three, right? So which one of it was it? 
I'll suggest to you that this is the second person of the Godhead. We never see the Spirit and we never see the Father acting in these type ways. But we do see Jesus in other occasions as we've looked in the beginnings of the Old Testament. And as we continue to look in the continuation of the Old Testament, we will see the second person of the Godhead doing these things. So I believe of Genesis 32, it's natural to consider that it was Jesus of whom Jacob wrestled with. We move on to Moses. We're going to have enough time to get these in. I wasn't sure we were. Go with me to Exodus 3. Exodus 3. Let's talk about Moses. What do you know about Moses? What do you know about Moses? Moses was the lawgiver. Moses was a deliverer. What about Moses' beginnings? What do you know about Moses, the beginning of Moses? That's right. When he was a very small child, a decree was made because the people of Israel grew very great. And therefore, the Pharaoh, the, the leader of the time, was afraid they would overtake them. So he decreed that all the children, the males of this particular group, to be put to death. Well, that was in the time frame. By the way, you and I worry about the time we live in. When you were born, was there a decree for you to be put to death? Well, I guess we're doing all right then. When your children were born, was there a decree to put them to death? I guess we're doing all right then. Keep things in perspective. So, so here's this individual, and we find him inside of Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. He's keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. And the angel Lord, verse 2, appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, what would you do if you saw a bush that was on fire that was not consumed? Just by the way, you're not going to see that, but what would you do? I, well, you know, some of us would run. Some of us would be intrigued and have to figure that out. Some of us would just say, you know, that's none of my business, and just walk on by. Well, what are you, Moses? Well, th verse 3 and verse 4, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, but why the bush is not burnt? He's intrigued. Verse 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Look at verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, if you'll look at chapter 3, you will notice that this one that appeared here, this one that's calling out is the same. Who is that? Well, he calls himself the Lord. He calls himself the Lord. Let, let's see a few things to, to, to follow these up. Look at verse 14. This same one said, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou uh, say unto the children of Israel, The I am has sent you. And Moses said, You're going to send me in there. What do I tell them? That they'll believe me? Well, tell them that the I am. Who is speaking here? It, it is definitely God. It's definitely God. Now, also... Inside of this very same account, if you'll go to Acts chapter 20, verse 30 and verse 38, and due to time we can't do this, the reference is made in Acts chapter 20, verse 30 and verse 38, that it was Jesus who was the one who was involved in Exodus chapter 3. So you have Moses who deals with Jesus, the second person of the Godhead. Let's move on to Joshua. We're going to have just enough time to get this done. Uh, go with me to Joshua chapter 1. I want you to see something in Joshua chapter 1 that I believe is very interesting. And then we're going to go to Joshua chapter 5. All right, what happens in Joshua 1, 1 and 2? Who has now died? Moses has now died. Who was Moses to Joshua? Who was Moses to Joshua or Joshua to Moses? However you'd like to ask it. What was happening to Joshua with Moses? All right, Moses was, he was being groomed for the future leading of God's people. Joshua 1, 1 and 2, what's happened? Moses has died. 
That's the past, okay? Everything that's taken place has culminated to this point. Go to Joshua chapter 5 now. Joshua chapter 5, and notice with me verse 13. Verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, they lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? All right, this is the sight that took place. Look at the action, verse 14. He said, Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord, I am, or now I am come. And Joshua fell, in his, fell, to the, fell to the earth and did worship him and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? All right, look at verse 14. What did Joshua do? He fell on his face and did what? All right. Who only is deserving of our worship? Is it fellow man that deserves our worship? It's only God. Look at verse 15. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe off thy foot, for the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Who is the only one that can make ground holy? By the way, who else stood on holy ground? Moses. Really interesting, the things that the very interesting that happened to Moses then happened to Joshua, almost in a timeline sequence of their lives. Early on, Moses stood on holy ground. Early on, Joshua stands on holy ground. Who makes the ground holy? It's only God. So that makes us ask the question, who is this in Joshua chapter 5 who is standing here as the captain of the Lord's host? I would suggest to you that it is the second person of the Godhead that we find inside of the New Testament, which is Jesus Christ. Now, these are not the only occasions of which we can say that would have been Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. There are about uh, four other major characteristic areas of which can be said. And then there are a number of other areas where people have concluded it could be. But here's what we know. And this is what you and I need to understand. Jesus worked throughout the Old Testament. And as we come tonight, where else is Jesus still working? If the past is that way, where else is Jesus still working? Not only the present, but also the future. So we'll talk about that tonight as we enter into our study period. And what we've seen so far are there are several occasions where Jesus is actively working in the Old Testament. Now we will pick up uh, next week and we will come back to studying the prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament. Uh, so we will study passages like Isaiah 7, 14, uh, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, but there are a large number of them that we will look at. We will only look at what I will call uh, some of the majors, but I will give you a list as much as I can of those prophecies concerning Christ. So I appreciate you uh, in our study today and look forward to our study next week as well. Thank you so much.